So I am going to talk about toilets. Uh, and my goal is to get you to talk about toilets. And I am also going to talk about shit. <laughs> and my goal is to get you to be more likely to talk about shit. In, you can use your own words. Now, because of what I do, I've actually been introduced by friends as Mr. Shit. <laughs> and my wife actually decided that a very nice personal gift would be to give me fossilized dung for a present. <laughs> but you know, I haven't always been a toilet geek. And in fact, I'm not even all that interested in normal toilets. Now, I have always been interested in and inspired by innovation. And from the mid-'80s until about five years ago, I found that innovation in software. For the next three years, I found it in clean tech. But for the last two years, I've been privileged to be involved with innovation so significant that it could truly save millions of lives by dramatically reducing the incidence of diarrhea and of terrible diseases like cholera, dysentery, typhoid, all these other afflictions you know, like some kind of super vaccine. But an innovation that could also contribute to, you know, to privacy, convenience, safety, dignity. Of course I'm talking about toilets, but what I'm talking about it are toilets that have been completely reinvented. So I know you're thinking, like, why do we need to reinvent the toilet? I mean, my toilet works just fine. But the next time you're sitting on your toilet, I want you to think about what happens after you flush and why. I mean, if you take the systems here in Seattle and in developed cities around the world, you know, we use water that's so clean we could drink it to flush our waste down miles of sewer lines to get to a modern wastewater treatment plant. You know, all this infrastructure takes a huge amount of money to install, put in place, but also to maintain and operate. And it takes a tremendous amount of energy to pump all that waste and to treat it before released. So now take a system like that and bring it to you know, communities where in many, oftentimes, the electricity is unavailable, unreliable, or unaffordable. Families don't have enough water to bathe and drink, let alone to flush. And there's simply not enough money whether in the forms of fees or taxes or other sources, you know, to pay for the replacement parts, the salaries, all the other costs that keep complex systems like this running year after year. So for these reasons, you know, while we can simply flush and forget, most people in the developing world simply cannot. In fact, a billion people don't have the use of a toilet at all. They defecate in fields, on beaches. Another three billion people do use toilets, but toilets that can still let them infect their neighbors. You know, either because they don't contain the waste, or they do, but when the pit or tank is emptied, it's just dumped into a nearby waterway or field, where you know, kids play, animals play, and bring all those germs back home, which is a huge problem because, as we saw before, you know, our, our fecal pollution is it's often literally toxic. Yeah, shit happens. Shit also kills, and it kills at astounding rates. This year, a child will die every minute as a result of diarrhea, largely caused by poor sanitation. In fact, bad sanitation is going to kill more people than die from automobile accidents and drownings combined. So we have a huge global public health issue here, but unfortunately it's one that people just don't want to talk about. And because they don't want to talk about it, we don't galvanize the energy and the commitment to fix it. Now, remember when people didn't want to talk about AIDS because it would mean you'd have to talk about sex? Well, we have a similar taboo here, where people who are quite interested in talking about the need for clean water, are very reluctant to talk about one of the key reasons why so much of that water simply isn't clean. And market forces have completely failed the poor here. 
You know, because since those of us in the rich cities are quite happy with our centuries-old approach to sanitation, you know, companies haven't invested the people and the dollars to come up with different alternatives. So it was this failure that led Bill Gates and others at the foundation to ask, I wonder if there's some way we could catalyze some innovation in this space. You know, that's a simple question. Imagine if we could invent a toilet that was its own treatment plant, powered only by what users deposited into it. An affordable toilet that would need no connection to a sewer line, a water line, or an electrical line. You know, four years ago, um, it wasn't clear that anybody was actively working on this. So the foundation launched the first Reinvent the Toilet Challenge in the hopes of inspiring scientists and engineers at leading universities around the world to get excited about coming up with new solutions to this problem. Well, it, it totally worked. By the next year, eight different teams had shipped their early stage prototypes to Seattle for the first Reinvent the Toilet Fair. Now, this is probably the first time many of you heard about the concept of a Reinvent Toilet. You know, we at the foundation, we learned that if you put um, headlines out there with Bill Gates and toilet in them, uh, they go viral. <laughs> now, some of the requirements of a reinvented toilet are actually really challenging. For example, they need to kill all of the pathogens in our waste that could make people sick. And some of them are really hard to kill. For example, the eggs from intestinal worms. You know, this is a big deal because two out of every seven people on the planet suffer from this. And it puts them at risk of impaired physical and cognitive development. So that's over two billion people suffering. Now, it's easy and inexpensive to treat, but people tend to get reinfected quite quickly. And so we need to find some way to stop the transmission. It's one more reason why we think the world needs a better toilet. We're not aware of any toilet on the market that can solve this today. Now, a second big challenge is to make these things affordable, even for poor families. Now, that's why from the beginning, the goal is no more than five cents per user per day cost, all in. And we chose that because five cents is actually what many poor people are paying for today, poor people in slums to use public toilets. We know that if we can hit that price point, we'll have significant demand, including from the poor. Now, finally, these must be, you know, appliances, products that men and women would aspire to own. They need to look nice. They need to smell nice. Now, these are the requirements of reinvented toilet version one. But of course, as technology moves on, they'll get cheaper, smaller. We also expect that the outputs will have value, either as fertilizer, cleaner water, maybe even excess energy. You know, my, my team likes to talk about turning shit into gold. And I tell them, like, for version one, let's just be really happy if we turn it into, like, something that's not toxic. <laughs> just last year, we had our second reinvent the toilet fair, this time in India. Uh, this time, twice as many teams sent their uh, toilet prototypes to a beautiful um, hotel in Delhi, a Taj Palace Hotel. They're all laid out on the beautiful grounds, and we had over 700 people come to visit them, many of them officials from South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the places, the regions where we focused our energies because it's home to most of the world's poorest. You know, the amount of progress since the first fair was truly remarkable. And what I'd like to do is introduce you to just a couple of these designs, because our partners take a diversity of approaches to solving this problem talk about a couple that are among the most mature. So the first design is from a team at Caltech. And they use an electrochemical reactor powered by an electrode coating that they invented for this that can efficiently um, break down the waste into sterile water and small amounts of germ-free solids. So the water gets just recycled within the toilet, reused, and the solids could frankly benefit any garden. The toilet's totally standalone. It's powered by its own a solar panel, small solar panel, uh, and it requires no water line coming in, no sewer line going out. 
Now, the first users of this technology, of course, were the students and the faculty at Caltech. They've been using one for almost two years. But more recently, um, a prototype has seen use in a public school, a primary school in China, and in a public park in India. And this is a picture of the most recent prototype. This is the processor, uh, processing unit, courtesy of the Kohler company, who is partnering with Caltech. Uh, this processes the waste of, um, from five apartment units, and it's being tested today in India. So the next team I want to talk a little bit about is the team at Loughborough University, which is about an hour north of London. They take a different approach. They bring the waste up to a high enough temperature and pressure that it kills all the pathogens. It also releases some of the energy in the feces as heat. The system captures that heat and uses it to help power the next processing cycle. So an approach like this could lead to a toilet that generates more energy than it uses. Again, what's the result is sterile water and sterile solids. And actually, the solids kind of look and even smell like used coffee grounds. Again, the first people that ever used these prototypes were the folks working on it. Uh, but this unit, uh, more recently, spent three months um, being used by a family living on the 11th floor of an apartment building in Chongqing, China. Uh, they, uh, they gave it high marks. You see a normal-looking toilet, the big, bigger unit to the left, that's the processor. Now, the exciting thing is the very next iteration of the processor is already less than half the size. So amazing progress. Now, to be clear, there's a lot of work left to do. You know, and we're not 100% sure that these designs or any of the other designs that our partners are working on, you know, that any of them are going to reach, you know, hit all of our requirements on day one. And this is leading edge innovation. We, we expect setbacks. We expect partial failures. But I'm incredibly optimistic because we now have like a growing number of designs that have solved the hardest problem. They've proven that they can kill all the pathogens on site using very little energy. This is, this is truly, this is remarkable. Now, all of this innovation is not going to really touch anybody's lives if there aren't companies that are excited about getting to the business of building, selling, and improving reinvented toilets. You know, these inventions, access to these inventions comes with some strings attached. The companies need to commit to selling affordable toilets to the poor. But the companies that are already engaging, they don't see this as charity. They see that as their target market. And it's a big market. Now, these units I've talked about uh, and others will be undergoing rigorous field testing in India and in Africa. So by this time next year, I hope that we'll have a lot more data, some real user feedback. And hopefully, our earliest partners will be starting to build launch plans for the first wave of reinvented toilets. You know, I am convinced that our partners are on a path to truly change the world. I mean, to dramatically reduce suffering and death and help women and men and children around the world live lives of greater dignity. See, the vision here isn't to kind of come up with a temporary solution uh, until these communities can afford sewer systems. It's to chart a completely new path, to build another gold standard for sanitation, and one that, in the face of climate change, can make cities far more resilient by reducing their demand for electricity and for water. Now, you might think, how, how could we assume that poor cities can simply leapfrog all the investments we've had to make in our richer cities? Well, remember, it wasn't that long ago that these same communities lacked access to another key service, communication. They waited for years for the governments or someone to lay down that expensive infrastructure that would help connect their landline phones to the rest of the world. I, mean, I, I don't think any of them are still waiting. Right? Mobile telephones completely revolutionized communications by requiring far less infrastructure and no physical connection. They're not like some temporary solution until the landline phones come. Uh, they've completely leapfrogged that technology altogether. And every year, more and more poor people can afford a mobile phone. 
Because every year they get cheaper and they get better. So I'm honored to be part of what might be the next big decentralized revolution. And I cannot wait to see how this one transforms the lives of men and women around the world. So, what might your future look like with regards to toilets? <laughs> you know, might you, a few years from now, find yourself, you know, grumbling over how much money your city is going to have to spend to upgrade its aging sewer systems. Or perhaps, you know, years from now, you'll find yourself in the midst of a drought, frustrated by how much your drinking water simply gets flushed away. Or, perhaps years from now, you'll find yourself reflecting on the fact that it was, you know, billions of people in poverty who inspired the innovation at the heart of that shiny new appliance that your child is carrying into your home. You know, the one that turns shit into gold. <laughs> Thank you.